Yes, so it Navot was recording is... all the time. Yes, so so Navot is recording the session, and also there is the um, the the presentation that is available. So you're very welcome to try and look things up. Uh, so you don't really have to write things down as I speak. I would like to make sure that you guys understand and follow everything I say. Usually when I see your faces and your eyes, it's easier for me to know whether you're with me or you're counting the tiles on the floor. Unfortunately, I can't do this at the moment. So we're going to try and work with what we have. If you have questions, please write it in the chat and then I'll respond as I finish with each topic. Okay, cool, cool. So this is my very pretty presentation, which I'm sure all of you are deeply impressed with. Um, it's uh, pink and blue, because this is what I had. This is the template I used, cool. So the first thing that we have to understand is the reason for why we have an organized speech. And sometimes, I know especially with students who haven't had a lot of practice talking to an audience and uh, having practiced their oral skills, is that we think, well, I make sense to myself. Why would I try to make myself engage into others or make myself organized to others? Like, especially Israelis, but sometimes other passionate forms of people try to say, well, organization really limits my self-expression and I wouldn't like to do it. And there's a number of reasons why not to do it. But beforehand, it's important to understand that to communications, there's three layers. I'll start by giving an example. Let's say I have a partner and I buy a beautiful dress and I try to dress at home and I walk up to my partner and let's say my partner's name is Shmulik. That's the name my partner has. My, yeah, his name is Shmulik. And I come up and say, Shmulik, look at me. Does this dress make me look fat? And Shmulik is stunned. He has no idea what to say. And the reason is that each one of us communicate different things. Because when I say, Shmulik, does this dress make me look fat? What I actually want to hear is, does anyone want to know what Valia wants to hear when I ask about the fatness of my dress? What do yes, I want to hear? That's what I, I, want to, I want to hear, Valia, I love you. You're always amazing. The coronavirus fat does not look bad on you at all. You look very pretty despite this dress being too small five sizes in you, right? This is what I want to hear. This is what I'm asking for. However, what I'm actually asking, the words that are being leaving my mouth are, does this dress make me look fat? However, what does Shmulik, right? Shmulik. What does Shmulik hear? What, what does Shmulik hear in his mind? I'm stepping into a trap. <laughs> right. Mayday, mayday. <laughs> back away slowly, throw chocolates from afar, right? And this is what we usually have with communication. We have three levels. We have what we actually want to convey. We have what is actually being said. And then we have what the other side is, being re is, is receiving. And what we're trying to do with speech organization is try to make sure that the three are aligned, to make sure that what we mean to say is in fact what is being received by the audience. So three reasons why we really need to have an organized speech. First of all, um, because then the audience and the, or, uh, have an impression that the lecture is professional and serious and they're more likely to listen, right? It feels like we're in control of what we're saying. It doesn't feel like, does this dress make me look fat? It, may, it sounds like I need your opinion and also your love, right? I need to have a very clear way to make sure that other people respect what they have to say. The second reason that we have an organized speech is to make sure that we don't forget the things that we want to say, right? More often than not, the biggest enemy of any public speaker is the public speaker himself, forgetting arguments, not remembering to give examples, and so on and so forth. And finally, if you have an organized speech, the chances are for the audience to remember what you said are much higher, minimizing the need for them to go 15 seconds backwards and in fact, try to listen to you again. So this is the three main reasons why we have an organized speech. This is not important for debate generally. It's just for your understanding as to why we're having this session. I will not quiz you on these three arguments, three, three reasons. But if you notice, even this slide is organized in a way that makes you feel like it's organized, right? It's very clear that there's three reasons. It's easy for you to follow them. And the chances are that you will are more likely to remember at least one or two, even if not all of three of them. So this is why organization really does matter. 
So the, set, the first thing that we'd like to do is we'd like to declare what you want to say. And here's what I'm going to say. When we talk about debates, there's the principle of three. And a lot of things in debates go in threes, mostly because it's an easy thing to remember. First of all, we'd like to say what we're going to talk about. Then we say what we are saying, what we're talking about at this very moment. And at the very end, we remind what we talked about during our speech. This gives us, but mostly the audience, tools to remember what were the topics that you were trying to give, right? So this is the reason, this is the principle of three that we're going to be talking about in depth today. So we start by starting to talk about, um, uh, let's go back, by declaring what you want to say. And this has a few things to talk about. Well, I will say that this is... Um, this has not worked very well for me, but okay, we'll figure it out. So the first thing that we want to say when we talk to an audience is we have to, we have to establish an opening or a hook. In debate, we call this fancy word a framing, which basically allows us to frame the whole debate and the perspective of the audience. Now, very, very quickly, I made a mistake with the slide that I am only seeing now. Um, the three points of... The, there's the first point, and then you have three uh, consecutive points. The three consecutive points are meant to be points under the first one, so they're explanations of the framing. Um, so there's meant to be one, two, and three, and that. So we'll get to it as we go through the argument, through the ideas. So first of all, a framing, right? If I ask you at this very moment, what was more interesting than listening to me? Most of you would have given me very good answer. Answers. If you'd like to share with us, you can just type it in chat. I would like to hear what is more interesting than listening to me at this very moment. Anyone wants to share? Because it's, I mean, it's okay. Lots of things are more interesting than me at this moment. I'm not sure if I'm seeing the chat. I'm not seeing the uh, chat. So you don't have to lie, right? I'm going to start. You know what's more interesting to me at this very moment, even though I'm speaking? My phone, it's been buzzing. I can't stop. I have to look at it. Anime is always more interesting, even though I don't watch it. But it's just, just it's just pretty. Also, Avatar Aang is a pretty, it's not anime, but it's pretty good, right? What else is more interesting than listening to me at this moment? My, okay, roommates okay. are very distracting. I agree. We always stare at ourselves in Zoom. This is true for everyone. We can't stop looking at ourselves all the time. Say, so, oh, is this what I look like? Is this what I sound like? Is this, oh, this background makes me look kind of fuzzy, right? And cats. I like cats, but they are annoying and they puke on carpets, right? So this means that anything going on around us is way more important than what is being said to us. Now, for me, it's a challenge. This is why I turn on the slides, turn them off, and so on and so forth and tell jokes. But when you're the speaker, you have to understand that for the people, for your audience, they have to have a very good reason to put their, their, their own reflection on Zoom, their cats, their roommates, anime aside, and they, why they have to listen to you. This is why we start with something in the bay that we call a framing, commonly known as a hook. You want to start by saying something that is going to make sure that the audience, A, wants to listen to you and B, understand, also under, makes them understand what you're going to talk about. In debate, we call this a framing. You frame the debate in such a manner that allows people to listen to you, to be interested and to understand what's going on. I'm going to give an example. Let's say we're debating about animal testing on animals. Are there any biologists, just by a raise of hand, any biologists in the, in the audience? who are, yep, yep, are you all killing uh, mm -hmm. monkeys? Yep, any monkey killers in the audience? Nice. So, so I could say, right, I'm not a biologist. I studied English literature. I know nothing about science. But I do know a, a thing or two about debate. And I can say, listen, I'm going to explain to you why testing on animals is a terrible thing. And you will all go, Varia, just like Hanan just yawned, this is boring. This is terrible. I don't want to hear about animal testing. I've had vegans show me things all day. I don't care about this anymore. But I could say, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to paint you a picture. Think of a tiny animal. Let's think of a cute animal. Let's think of a rabbit. 
And think of a rabbit that has never seen the light of day. It has never touched the grass under its paws, just like the grass I had have in my background. Think of a rabbit that has never felt a warm touch of its mother and has never felt the comforting taste of delicious food. This is a small animal that has always been caged, never walked, never jumped, never felt happiness, and has only felt pain from needles and terrible things that humans are doing for them only for the sake so that I can have lipstick. Now, when I, can, when I said animal testing is terrible, and when I said gave you the whole story of the rabbit, in both times, like both ideas can be summarized in animal testing bad, right? You agree with me. Like the bottom line is the same bottom line. But when I told you about the story about the rabbit, you went, mm, I feel like my feelings are somewhat being engaged. Uh, and the chances are that after the second introduction, the second framing, you're going to listen more to what I have to say. Now, you don't have to be as dramatic as I am, right? Because we're all different people. You can just say, you can quote numbers. And here's where my point in the, uh, uh, in the, in the presentation goes. So when you talk about framing, you can start by say, you can either start by establishing the facts. You can say X number of animal testing is done for cosmetics industry. And we think that this is terrible and it's needless. You can give an example. You can give some imagery. All of these things allow the audience to engage, whether emotionally or whether just spark their interest in what you're going to say, right? This is more often than not that uh, even uh, fancy and smart um, people of science like to have silly titles to their documents, right? Because it makes people read um, and it makes people listen to you. And this is what we want to have in a speech. We want to have, make sure that whoever is listening to us has a very good reason to listen. And this is what we call a hook or a framing that allows me to understand what the whole debate is going to talk about, right? So this is the first thing. The second thing, and the most important one, is roadmap. Before I talk about the roadmap, anyone have any questions about framing or the opening of a speech? No questions? All very clear? I'm going through your faces. All of you look very sad. I'm sorry. I have a question. <laughs> yes. I have a question, but I'm not sure it's uh, about this exact, exact point. Like, uh, how, how do you relate to manipulation? Because it looks like there, you have to manipulate us in order to us listen to you. Ah, that is, that is a great question. Uh, I will say that debate does not honor manipulation. As of this moment, everything that has to do with feelings and pretty examples and literary devices are gone. All of them have been finished in the opening. They don't play a role in debate because debate actually talks about uh, rational reasoning. So it's an interesting way to hook people in, but it's not what actually makes people believe you specifically in debate. And you're judged solely on the logic of your ideas. So emotion or having fun imagery, I said fun and I talked about that. Uh -huh, this is okay, nihilistic humor is my thing. But basically what I'm saying is that emotion is not necessary in debate and it's better if it's not there because it usually comes at the expense of, of um, analysis. And that's usually not the greatest thing to have around when you try to persuade people. So that's basically it. Cool. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat and I'll try to respond later. Um, so you start with a framing. Then what you do is you talk, you do have a roadmap. And a roadmap basically is a way for your audience to follow through your speech. I'm going to give you an example. And I'm going to give you an example by saying stuff. And I'm going to give you a very... Um, a, clever speech. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to explain to you why hamburgers are healthy. And I know that all of you are very curious as to why a person who claims to be logical like myself thinks that hamburgers are healthy. And I'm going to give you three reasons why. The first reason is that hamburgers are too delicious to not be healthy. Second of all, 
I'm going to explain to you why hamburgers are healthy. And that is because, um, trying to think of reasons, because hamburgers are a salad. And third reason is that hamburgers are healthy because healthy people eat hamburgers. Let's begin with the last argument. Why are health, why are hamburgers are healthy? Because healthy people eat hamburgers beforehand. Have I given any of you any explanation as of to what I'm going to talk about? Is Yes. So whoever is saying yes, you're wrong because I have no explanation. I just have titles, right? Nothing I said to you up until this point is actually persuasive, but it is allowing you to grab the general idea of what I'm going to talk about, right? So I give you three reasons. One, hamburger is a salad. Two, healthy people eat hamburgers. Three, hamburger is too delicious to be bad for you, right? Three reasons. None of them are particularly persuasive because none of them have an explanation. And this is a roadmap. A roadmap is giving the titles of the arguments to your audience before explaining them so that they can follow them through. So let's start and explain. So I think hamburger is a salad. We all know that salads are healthy. So if a hamburger is a salad, it has to be healthy, right? So what we all know is that hamburgers are usually made from cows. Cows usually eat greens like grass. Grass is basically a salad. <clears throat> so it means that what a cow does is converts delicious salad into more delicious meat. So a meat basically is a form of a salad. So a hamburger basically is a form of a salad. So in fact, when I'm eating hamburger, I'm just eating a more delicious form of meat. So the first reason that I have why hamburgers are healthy is because hamburgers are essentially salads. The second reason is that healthy people eat hamburgers. Listen, you guys, I checked 97% of athletes eat meat. 95% of athletes eat red meat. This means that they definitely have eaten hamburgers in their life. This means, most importantly, is that if healthy people eat hamburgers, this pretty much makes hamburgers not that bad for you, probably makes them good. So hamburgers are healthy because healthy people eat hamburgers. My third reason, however, is that hamburgers are so good that they can't be possibly bad for you. Listen, all of you guys, scientists, I'm going to explain this to you in a very clear way. We know that God made this world as an all-loving, all-caring, wonderful being. He couldn't have made something so delicious, so wonderful, so yummy, and to make it bad for you. This would make God big, old, and mean. This means that hamburgers are definitely good for you if God made them so delicious. But you'll say, wait, 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 Faria, you're at Weizmann. We're rational beings. This makes no sense. We either don't believe in God or understand that God has a complex character. And I'll say, fine, evolution works as well, right? We believe in evolution survival of the fittest. This means that the ones with the most fitting intuition and desires survived over time. This means that we have the healthiest habits. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived over time. This means that if we crave hamburgers, then they're necessary for our survival, making them healthy. So basically, hamburgers are so good for you that they can't possibly be bad. So I have three reasons. First of all, hamburgers are salad. Second of all, healthy people eat hamburgers. Third reason, hamburgers are so good for you, they can possibly be bad. By a raise of hand, who is persuaded? I'm ashamed that you're a scientist and persuaded by this nonsense. I mean, obviously, it's so easy to explain why I'm wrong, right? It's not a, it's not a problem. But who can recite the arguments that I made? Who remembers my arguments? Uh, I can recite, I think, at least one of them because I'm trying to answer you in the chat. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Yasmin, give me one argument. Okay, you said that uh, since athletes eat meat and they eat red meat, and red meat is necessarily, and athletes, uh, so necessarily healthy people eat meat and eat hamburger. Therefore, hamburger must be healthy. Problem is, I think you guys, oh, you assume you're, that you're, athletes are healthy. Well, which, I'm, I didn't, but this is, we're not getting to the point where I'm wrong. Because I think I, I get a good idea why I'm wrong. But right, this was my first argument. What was my other argument? Anyone remembers? 
wants to jump into the conversation. That cows eat greens, uh, therefore they eat greens. For some reason, that makes them also salads. I they actually lost it. Sa <laughs> hamburger is a salad. Guys, you don't have to be a biologist to understand how, you know, the cycle of life works. Great. What was my third reason? I lied because I said I had the third reason, but in fact, my third reason had two sub arguments. Who remembers them? God gave us the to eat uh, something is it tasty right, and right. not, had be, not cannot be uh, not good for us. Right, right. So God made hamburgers for some reason, right? Um, and what else? What was the other reason? Evolution, Evolution programmed us to love hamburgers and therefore exactly. hamburgers are good for us. And here's what I'm going to say. The goal of my speech was really, really not to persuade you. Because I know this is nonsense. <laughs> Don't tell me that it is. I really do know that this is nonsense. However, about five minutes ago, you had none of this information in your head. And I promise you, you'll remember at least one argument when you go and eat dinner with your friends today or tomorrow. And you're going to say, you have no idea. Bites when he tastes pain, this crazy lady, to lie about science. And here's what we're working on. We're working on making sure that the audience remembers what you're trying to say. And this is the principle of three, right? So we have a hook. I said, hamburgers are healthy. All of you went <laughs> nonsense and you started to listen, right? I didn't sell an emotional story, but I made sure that you had an interest to listen. Then what I, I said, I'm going to give you the topics of what I'm saying, right? And then it was easier for you to follow through when I was actually explaining to you the arguments And then I reminded you at the end about the titles of our arguments. And this, the principle of three, saying what I'm going to say, explaining it, and then reminding it about it at the end, allows for the audience to actually remember and follow through your speech, even if it's utter nonsense, close to blasphemy, and disregards what biology basically is, right? So we're going to go back to our... Um, to my very, very pretty uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, thing. And I'll remind you that we just talked about this, right? So we have a framing, we have a roadmap where you foreshadow the upcoming arguments. And here's something that I didn't say out loud because I was making an independent speech that was not part of, a, of an actual debate. In debate, what we usually do is we engage with other teams. We're going to get to this in a couple of minutes, how debate actually works. But in debate, you have eight speakers. Eight speakers mean that you have to respond to other arguments. In debate um, words, we call this rebuttal, which is responding to the arguments of the opposing teams. So if I were making the same speech, I would say hamburgers are healthy. I'm going to have three points. And after declaring the titles of the arguments, you, I would have responded to what the other team has already said. This is what would have happened. Um, basically. So this, so when you just talk about what you're going to say, you have three things that you have to point out. One, a framing. Two, a roadmap. Three, a rebuttal. When you respond to the opponent's arguments. It's a little difficult to do this because I'm doing this solo. And But once you do the debate today, it's going to become way more easier and way more approachable to understand how this works. Afterwards, what we're going to, what we usually do is we actually sit down and explain the arguments. This means that we have to make sure that we have usually between two to three arguments in a classic debate speech. Today, you're going to speak for only five minutes, but in classic debate, you, in BP, which is British Parliamentary, which is what we're playing, you have seven minutes speeches. Um, and usually during those seven minutes, you make two stops, three arguments, When I make a speech, I have only two arguments. And this is, this foreshadows, <laughs> it's a funny word, um, the level of in-depth analysis that you're meant to have within each argument. Um, and actually next week, we're going to talk about how to develop arguments and how that comes into play. <clears throat> um, so today we're only talking about the presentation. Tomorrow we're going to actually start talking about the content of each argument. So... Two points to make sure that we understand when you explain the arguments, right? When you actually explain why hamburger is a salad or why um, hamburgers are so delicious so. they can't be bad for you. Um, basically, there's two things that you have to remember, and they're, they're in this uh, slide. So first of all, make sure that you have separate arguments and present them in a linear manner. 
this means that if I were making my silly speech about the hamburgers and I talk, well, I'm first going to talk about uh, the evolution and evolution is so great. It makes us want the best things, you know, just like athletes want the best things, which makes them healthy. This would have mushed my arguments together, not made them separate and would have been harder for you to follow through. So make sure that your arguments are, if you have two separate arguments, make sure that they're separate and that they're linear. This means that you don't go around the argument and you say, well, our hamburgers are healthy because they're good for you because they're healthy and somehow God is in the process. But rather try to make sure that the argument is clear and is separated. The second thing to remember when you explain the argument is that you flag them. Think of when you put little flag posts or like um, mini golf tiny flags or uh, sure there's like, I can think of like a few computer games where you just plan your route and you flag put flag so your character knows where to go. I'm a nerd. Um, so flagging actually means that you explain to the judge, this is where they are at your speech. So if you remember in my exemplary speech about hamburgers, what I said was, I'm now talking about the salad argument. My salad argument is, right? So these are a lot of unnecessary words, so it would seem. However, these are words that allow the audience to concentrate on what I'm saying instead of just jumping into and saying, well, cows eat grass, grass is a salad, goes into the cow, becomes a hamburger, hamburgers are salad. This introductory, this flagging of the argument is very important in order for the audience to understand what you're talking about at each point. It's also going, it's also very beneficial, just a side note, if you're presenting at a conference and more often than not, people are so sure that their research is easy to understand that they forget to do this. Fun fact, I, my best, I have a really good friend, she's my best friend, and she just turned in her thesis. She's been trying to explain to me what her thesis is for two years. After two years, she's finally managed to explain to me because I never understood what she was talking about at any given moment because she does this thing where it's math, math, like mechanical engineering and physics mashed together. She's really smart. Um, and, and, you know, I have no idea because she never stopped to say, this is what I'm talking about. This is the importance of this argument. This is how it's connected to everything else. So it's really is about being very explicit about what you're saying. Right. So this is about presentation of the arguments. Next week, we're going to go in depth of how to build each argument. OK. Ilya Kapara Aleja, please put yourself on mute. I love to see your face, but. <laughs> so. OK. Ilya is a second year. I know him. I can make fun of him a little bit sometimes. OK, cool. Any questions about the bit of the explanation of the arguments, just about the presentation? We're not talking about content today. Questions? When you talked about the rebuttal, um, is there a certain... Um, you're, you're muted for some reason. You started off fine and then you became muted. Sorry. Yeah. OK. okay. Um, is there a specific reason why the rebuttal is after your own arguments? It's, it's not after your own arguments. It's after the presentation of the arguments, but before the explanation of the arguments. Oh, OK. Um, I, I will say that technically, in a game, you can place them wherever you want. However, um, two reasons why you would just put them there. One, there's just a convention. People expect it to be there. And if the goal of your speech is for people to be able to follow through, having a conventional format is easier, just that. And the second reason is that if we tend to be so in love with our own arguments, that when we develop them, we never finish on time, ever. You will explain your arguments for all seven minutes and forget to respond to the other team. So it's basically trying to deal with your own, with our own um, self-love of our arguments, basically. Thanks. Other questions? Can I ask? Um, I, I'm a little bit confused about the roadmap. It looks like the roadmap uh, uh, appears everywhere, like in, in the first part, in the second part, right? Well, like, no, so the roadmap, you say, I'm going to have three arguments. Let's say, okay, let's say, I'm going to explain why 
mandatory vaccination is good for three reasons. One, it helps the children. Two, it creates herd immunity. Three, it allows for the vulnerable in society who can't vaccinate to be able to be part of society. And that's it. And then you go, and so that's, one. That's a framing, right? No, that, so, no, no, that, that's, the, that's the roadmap. That's just oh. the roadmap. Okay. Right, and then, and then when you go, in, and then you say, I'm going to respond to the other team, and then you go, so first of all, why does this help the children? You go into explanation how vaccination works. Two, why does it help herd immunity? And you explain herd immunity. Mm, okay. And then three, you say you talk about um, the vulnerable people, and then you talk about people who have terrible immune systems or they have cancer or whatever, and then talk about that. So what's the framing? Framing is the first sentence that you utter your mouth, utter from your mouth. So you would, I would say, okay. you, I would say, uh, COVID nineteen has proved that. We are still vulnerable to diseases, that people die in large numbers. And this is why we think that specifically in this time when we, when let's say the ice is melting and terrible diseases have been released into the world, people keep eating weird animals and keep getting sick from these weird animals. We think this is the time that we really have to make sure that vaccination happens on time. So that at least the diseases we do know how to handle, we handle well. And that's the framing. That's just like an opening bit. Mm, okay, thank uh, yes. you. Sure. Cool. Other questions? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, are there cases in which it's uh, okay like to mix the arguments or to use one argument to boost another argument, or is it best to generally keep them separate? So I would, I will say that just a side point in debate we'll talk about this a little bit later in our in our course debate usually we judge holistically this means that i don't give you points per argument to say oh he said two arguments so two points to Rave, right i don't this is not how we do we'll look at the whole general idea sometimes arguments are built one on top of the other like my example with the vaccination the fact that it helps children means that it's also going to create better herd immunity right these two can be dependent on one another. Um, however, this is why you also, when you have arguments, you want to make sure that you structure them in separate orders, like in, in logical order, sorry, to make sure that, that like the, the building blocks are there. However, usually it's just easier to follow through. I will say that I know some excellent speakers who just have one long argument spanning over six minutes, and then they just make different bottom lines through the argument. And I think that's also a good strategy if you know how to do this well, at least for now, just to work on your organization, I prefer that you stuck to this format. When you practice for a year, you can do whatever you want. Worst case, I'll tell you that you can do, you should do it differently. Thank you. Make sense? Other questions? No? Okay. So we're gonna go back to our, um, to our presentation and to go to our one couple before last um, slides. So at the end of your speech, after you finished presenting your arguments, you really want to remind the audience of what you said. If you remember my, uh, my hamburger speech at the very end, I said, so I talked about one, two, and three. And this really helps hammer into our minds what, what, has, what, what I said, right? So what you want to do is to make sure that you have a conclusion and you want to have two things one of which I didn't have in my hamburger speech. First of all, you want, to have, you want the audience to remember the bottom lines that were presented. But secondly, you really want to call to action. My hamburger speech really didn't have a purpose, right? It was just like Varya being silly so that it was, it was more fun to listen to me. I didn't talk about, you know, the Azerbaijan international relationships at the moment because it's god awful to listen to. Um, but what I will say is that most debates, you want to create a change, right? For example, should we have animal testing? Should we mandate vaccines? This usually creates a policy or a change in society. So at the end of your speech, what you really want to have is a sentence that says, this is why you want to mandate vaccines. This is why you want to ban animal testing. This is why you want to force feed hamburgers to everyone, right? 
So at the end of every argue, every speech, you really want to have a call for action to make sure that people know what is the message that they are meant to come out, come out, out of your speech. Now, often I'm asked, um, Varia, um, what is it that makes you think that um, we need all of this? I think I speak very clearly. I think it's quite easy to follow through. And I will say this. First of all, we're not as clear or as organized as we think that we are. But more importantly, five times out of six, debaters forget at least one of the principle of three. Either they forget to have a roadmap, either they forget to explain with a flagging, or they forget a conclusion. This means that if you try to follow through with the format, even if you forget one of these things, one of these points, chances are that you're still going to get to the other points, making sure that you in fact have made your, yourself clear and the arguments have titles. Too often I struggle with listening to lovely debaters who have a very long speech and I have no idea what they're trying to get to, what their bottom line is, what the actual argument is, other than specific words from their speeches. So this is actually just meant to make sure that it's easier to follow through. Any questions about speech structure? Yeah, about uh, flagging. You said that oftentimes people forget one of the key things. Yeah. Um, I just imagine like if every speaker always like counted one, two, three, you get pretty old and pretty annoying. Like I would find that kind of uh, just reciting something from the head instead of like speaking freely. So is that something to, to consider that sometimes following the same format every time is kind of annoying and boring? Well, basically, I, I think it's the same response that I've had previously, and that is in debate, what really matters is the content. The format is just there to make your content more approachable. But I will ask you different questions. Have you felt that through this, these, the past 45 minutes, I've been very repetitive saying one, two, three very often? No. But I'm doing this, right? I said, we're going to talk about speed structure. Then I said, we're talking about speed structure. And what I just said a minute ago was, I just talked about speed structures. Have you got any questions? So what you don't have to follow this, the very same words. You don't have to say, I'm, I'm doing a roads map. I'm going to have three arguments. You can say, I'm, my high, the topic for today is why having children is a, an illegitimate moral choice. I think there's three reasons for this. Firstly, I think that having children creates more pain in the world generally. Second of all, I think it creates more pain for the child specifically. And thirdly, I think that it shows a lot of egoism from the side of the parents, which I think is terrible. So let's talk about the general suffering. So you don't necessarily have to go one, two, three, but it really just creates a framework of mind, right? If you, I'm sure that you've written like um, works or papers for university and you have so quite a similar outline, right? You have like an opening statement or like an introduction where you generally talk about what you're going to talk about. And you have like the first sentence of each paragraph talks about what the paragraph is going to talk about. So it's very similar principles really. And it's about how well you use them, right? You can have a fifth grade essay and then you can have a university level essay. And one is going to be annoying and repetitive and the other one is going to be fun and great to read. So it's about practice really. Cool. Uh Hi, Maria. I have a question. So, yes. Uh, uh, I did not understand the your conclusion part. So, let's say you started uh, the hamburg hamburger is healthy, then you you mentioned three reasons and you gave the uh, you you gave your arguments. Then, what should be the conclusion part? I mean, the conclusion should be hamburger is healthy, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so in the conclusion, you have two parts. I, I, first of all, you say you repeat the titles of your arguments. So in the conclusion, you said, I have three arguments. One, hamburger is a salad. Two, uh, healthy people eat hamburgers. Three, evolution and God, right? So the conclusion, first of all, you remind people of the titles of your arguments. Mm -hmm. This is one. And two, you say, and this is why I think hamburgers are healthy. And this is why this, this is the the call to action. This is the bottom line that you want the audience to leave your speech with. So it's really about working on memory. 
if you have a good judge in a debate competition or just a very attentive audience, they can do without, I agree, it doesn't have a purpose. The thing is that most people like myself have a ringing phone as I'm speaking. This means that it's very difficult for all of us to keep our attention span for seven minutes or God forbid, if you are actually having a presentation at a conference, speak for 45 minutes on Zoom with other, other people's children running in the back, like at the back of their, you know, of, of, of their house. So having this conclusion, even if it feels repetitive, is really, really important. And that's the purpose is just aiding people's silly brains, basically. So one should divide the total times, let's say seven minutes into uh, like, uh, like one minute for roadmap and uh, the, the structure. And uh, I like your thinking five, today. Five we'll be, I like yes. your thinking today. We'll be speaking for five minutes and yeah. I wouldn't worry about managing your time. But yes, mm -hmm. time management is very important. We'll talk about this when we today we're just working on speech structure. When we talk about content and you have to handle your time within your speech, it's going to be become a little bit more relevant. But yes, time management is crucial. I have mm -hmm. terrible time management. I will say that mm -hmm. not in life, only in debate. In life, I'm always on time. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the rebuttal, I'm yes. not sure where it uh, enters. What, what it, uh... After the roadmap, before the presentation of the arguments. And what does it consist of? Replying to the arguments of the opposing teams. Okay. We'll thank talk you. about this next week. I promise. Oh, okay. It's just a lot of information to dump on your heads in one go. Thanks. Uh, could our rebuttal be part of the hook at the beginning? Uh, I'd rather not. It is possible. It is possible. Just today specifically, I'd rather you didn't. Um, it can be, but it usually means that it puts your speech in a very negative light. And it's not clear what the positive material that you are promoting is. That's the only issue I have with it. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Okay. Other questions? Um, I actually didn't hear the question of Yasmin, so I, uh, and I, so I didn't know the context of what you answered. You... Ah, Yasmin asked if, uh, if you can have rebuttal as part of your framing, or your framing can include rebuttal, basically. Thank you. Other questions? I got one. Yes. Um, about the um, example you gave earlier about the vaccinations. Yes. Um, so you had three arguments, right? You had the herd immunity, you had the children, and you had uh, the at-risk communities, right? Yes. And to me, like I'm hearing that and I'm thinking at-risk communities can go out because of herd immunity. So it seems like you actually have two arguments, but you're dressing them out as, as three. And I that's agree. sort of I agree. They can be, I agree. They can be one argument. Um, you can make them into three different. They can be separate and they can be put together depending on what bottom lines you have. So you can have them all as a bottom line, but you can say the, the generally you can say the bottom line of the herd immunity argument is that we just really like to know that as a group of people, there's not a lot of sick people. And herd immunity basically means that even if you don't know that you're vulnerable or maybe your vaccination didn't work, you're still safe. And then you say, but there is a specific subgroup, a separate group of people that can never be vaccinated and talk about them separately. But I agree, it's about your choice. And if I thought about it more, I'd probably split them differently. So what I'm saying is that there's definitely overlap between the two. So yes. should you address that? Maybe use the herd immunity as a stepping stone for the at risk or something like Probably. that? Probably. Yeah, this is why when making this argument, start with the children, then herd immunity, then at risk people. Other questions? Okay, cool. So I'm very quickly going to explain what debate looks like, um, just for a second. And what you see on the screen is a debate room. This is a debate format. In debate, we have four teams. 
We have opening government, which we see on the top left corner. We have opening opposition, which we have on the top right corner. We have closing government at the top, at the bottom left corner and closing opposition in the bottom right corner. Every team has two speakers. Listen carefully, both speakers speak. Every year there's a confusion about this. Both speakers speak. Each speaker for this debate is going to have five minute speeches. And you're going to have a judge. Some of you are going to have um, more experienced people from the debate to speak for them. Most of you won't though. Uh, the goal of today is just to practice the format. We're not going to give you rankings. We're not going to give you anything like it's not going to be a competition, but you are going to get feedback for your practice. Each team, as you can see, like opening government team, which is the corner left top, has two speakers. The, it's just titles. They don't mean anything. But the first speaker is prime minister. The second speaker is deputy prime minister. On the opening opposition, we have leader of opposition and deputy leader of the opposition. The order of the speakers is like a zigzag. So the first speaker is prime minister, then comes leader of opposition. After leader of opposition, we have deputy prime ministers, deputy prime minister, then deputy leader of the opposition. So each time you have a person from the other side of the bench. So the left side are all people who are in favor of the topic. The right side is people against the topic. Okay, this means that the only person in the debate who does not have a rebuttal is the prime minister, is the first speaker of the debate, does not have a rebuttal. He has no one to rebut. Are there questions? Um, what, about what's this? rebuttal? Rebuttal is when you reply to the, oppos to the opposing team's arguments. Any other question? I have, I have yeah. a question. Yes. Um, if you can't rebuttal, um, yes. can you uh, use like a rebuttal even if it, no one has pointed it out? I mean, like. Um, you can just say the other team had no arguments to rebut, so I'm not going to do it <laughs> and be a prick about it. You can do that. Okay. I think you meant more preemptively. I, I mean, can the prime minister like. Um, Ah, um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you can think of what the other side is going to say, when, when I, I'm a prime minister, this is my job in debate, I always go, the opposition are going to go so and so and so and so, but of course they're wrong ahead of time. And then I say why, why they're going to be wrong. But it, it's a fun job because you have to foresee their arguments. It's a lot of fun. Um, why, why I like debates. But if you can do that, do that. If you don't, it's fine. Not like practice whatever you want in that regard. So there are eight sessions? Eight speakers. Eight speakers. Eight speakers. Okay, and each speaker can speak once? Yes. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, so are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the member of each side what are the roles? There are roles. We're not going into roles. You just have to speak for your side. On the left. So, the so, so it's the prime minister, leader, deputy, deputy member, member? Yes, gov government with government, uh, opposition with, 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 yeah. For, against, for, against, for, against, for, against. So, so, and each one should have new arguments? Like yes, I'd like each speaker to have at least one argument. If you can think of two, even better. If you can't think of more than two arguments, perfectly normal. Okay, just a very quick clarification. There's, there's a reason why we have two teams on both sides. Opening government and closing government are competing against each other. This means that member of government and government whip should have better arguments than prime minister and deputy prime minister. Member of the opposition and opposition whip should have better arguments than leader of the opposition and deputy leader of opposition. Um, so this is important to remember that this is a competition between 
all four teams. It's not like two teams, like, like one against the other. It's one against three. You're clever people, you'll get it. Cool. How do you compete against your teammates? With diligence and fire is the Sam. I had a math teacher that would always say that. I'd ask Mendel, how do you answer this question? And he would say, quickly and correctly. Sam, and basically the the thing is that you usually have each debate topic has at least five arguments for each side. And one of the things that you really try to explain is not just why you're right, but why you're more correct than the other side. So let's say we're talking about hamburgers and government says, we think hamburgers are great because athletes eat hamburgers. And then second government can come out and say, listen, open government talked about hamburgers and athletes. We're going to give you two arguments, one evolution and two salad. We have more arguments and also they're more important. And that's why what we have to say is more important. Basically, we're imitating politics, right? You have a coalition, but the coalition is, a, is composed of different parties who are also interfighting, which, which is what makes Israeli politics so much fun and stable, right? So this is how you do it. It's going to be easy, become more easy to understand as we actually play the game. Other questions? What is a week? Is a summary speaker. Mm-hmm. It's okay. It's the last speaker. It's just the, the like the way I would like to 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 call it because we're pretentious. Did each speaker use the same structure that you presented. Yes, each speech. Each each speaker has the same structure. Mila mm-hmm. asks in the roadmap, where do I place the reply to the other side arguments before your arguments, but after the presentation of your arguments, the rebuttal goes. Maria, I need some, I need a clarification. Could you please yes. go back to your slide? Uh, could you please go back to your slide? The... Ah, yes, the... sure. Yeah. Okay. So at first, prime minister will speak, then the leader of opposition. Yes. Then the deputy prime minister, and yeah. then deputy leader of opposition. Yes. So then the member of the government, so the member of the government will uh, give his or her argument, which, uh, which uh, I mean, the member of the government can give the arguments against the uh, first four of uh, first four persons. I mean, the uh, so, so member of the government has to rebut, has to say, speak against opposition but Mm -hmm. he can't knife he can't speak against government he just has to give better arguments but he doesn't rebuttal them he doesn't say why they're wrong Mm -hmm. so we have so all the like the governments and all the oppositions have Mm -hmm. to be consistent within themselves Mm -hmm. okay cool one last question yes yeah i have one um what happens if i make an i have like an argument and then the people before me just said it and i'm like okay i can't say the same thing again great question great question what you usually do in second half is you think of more than one argument because you also have more time to prepare the first teams have only the preparation time but you have more time during the debate so you try to think of as many things and then try to say the things that haven't been said. There is a class when we talk about second half teams, and then I give you all the tools that you need to try to think of new arguments. Ido asks, why not respond first and then give you arguments? You do respond first. If you have roadmap, which is not the arguments, you just the titles, then you respond and then you actually give the arguments themselves. The reason we give the roadmap before the rebuttal is to allow the judge and the audience to follow your your speech easier cool okay i'm going to stop here (laughs) i think this is if you have any more questions you're very welcome to ask uh me in chat or in private i think this is fine um we're going to go and uh have a short break and then what we're going to do is navot navot are you are you around to help me yeah this is yes. your, your partner, if you can watch. Yes. So what's going to happen is that um, you are going to... Um, oh, Navot, I put like... Okay, never mind. 
Um, this is great. So you're going to go, you're going to be assigned into a Zoom room with the people you are meant to debate. Please write down the names of the people you're debating with. Um, okay, so Violet, let me take over, sorry. Yes, do it. So what you see here, each column is a room and this is a couple, a pair that is going to debate together. You debate in pairs, why I explained this to them, right? Okay, so please let me know if someone does not see himself in this room. As you can see, there is one room which will be shorter. We have only half a room. This is going to happen from time to time. And sometimes you will also judge because uh, not always we are divided by eight. Uh, so please unmute yourself and say something if you don't see yourself. Avot, 